I've been seeing those TikTok and Instagram videos of people being like, I did this for two weeks and look how my abs look different. Well, okay, there's similar stuff popping up on YouTube. Like I cut out carbs for two weeks. I cut out bread for two weeks and look what happened. Okay, I have to say, I understand that that kind of content gets views, but this channel is committed to evidence-based content. But I wanted to still kind of be able to do those kinds of videos, but in a little bit more of a fun, educational, scientific way. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a biochemical, physiological look at what happens when you cut out carbs for two weeks. We're gonna take a little ride with a hormone called glucagon and get an idea of what happens inside your body once the carbs are gone. Full disclaimer, two weeks of cutting out carbs, although will make some powerful physiological changes and some pretty decent molecular changes, they're not gonna really last if you just do it for two weeks and then go back to your normal eating. Okay, I think it goes without saying, but you know, any results that you get, the body is highly adaptable. It's going to change and go back. However, it's still exceptionally fascinating to know what happens, and maybe it's motivating and inspiring to get you to try something different. So let's break it down. After this video, speaking of cutting out carbs, I recommend you check out a company called Unbun. Unbun is a low carb bread, okay, made with flax, made with uh, almond flour, made with, it's just awesome, made with psyllium, made with egg whites. They are tremendous. They have bread, they have bagels, they have tortillas, they have pizza crust. It is unreal. They're at a lot of Whole Foods stores, but also you can get them online. So there's a special link with special pricing for Unbun. They're a supporter of this channel. I'm on their advisory board. I help them out with a lot of things. It's awesome. So that link is down below. You can get a special discount and check them out. A big thank you to them. So I'm serious though, like their tortillas, like if you mix that up with a little bit of good quality deli meat, a little bit of cheese, make a little wrap, like it's, you don't get to have that stuff when you're doing low carb. And someone finally made a low carb tortilla that is not full of gluten and not full of garbage. So huge shout out to them. They are insanely cool. And again, that link with a special discount is down below in the description. So check them out after this video. All right, so it's been 18 hours since you had your last carb. You're freaking out a little bit. Here's what's happening. You have this little guy called glucagon. Okay, this glucagon is a hormone that is the opposite of insulin. When you eat carbs, you have a spike in insulin. Okay, when you stop eating carbs, your insulin levels go down. But in the opposite world of insulin, we have glucagon. And it's glucagon's job to say, well, there's no carbs coming in, so we need to go find fuel from other sources. Okay, so we're gonna follow him along a little bit. So after about 16, 18 hours of not eating carbs, all of a sudden your liver is drained of carbohydrates. So for that first 18 hours, you've been running on carbohydrates that were stored in your liver. It's like a little sack of sugar hanging out in your body, secreting little bits of glucose for your cells to use. But uh-oh, red alert, at about 18 hours, that liver just ran out. So what happens now? Well, it starts moving on to the next tissue, starts trying to find ways to liberate more glucose. In fact, there was a study that was published in FASEB journal that found that when carbs were eliminated, glucagon levels were universally elevated. So people that were on low carb or no carb diets, universally you saw glucagon being elevated. So it's definitely responsible for this. Okay, well people think that once you burn through the liver carbs that your body starts automatically burning through the carbs in your muscles. It's not quite that easy, okay? Like the carbs that are in your muscles, those get burned more through like activity and things like that. Your body doesn't just like drain those stores, especially if you're not active. So glucagon is like, uh, okay, the liver is now empty of carbohydrates. So body's starting to panic a little bit. So what does glucagon do? It goes to the next tissue. In this case, it's fat. So it goes to the adipocyte, the fat cell, knocks on the door and it says, hey, fat cell, uh, we're out of carbs. You, you mind loading up into the bloodstream so we can have some fuel for this guy? And the fat says, all right, sure. So you have this thing called hormone sensitive lipase that sits on the outside of a fat cell. It reaches in, it grabs the fat out of the fat cell and the fat cell turns into a free fatty acid or the, the lipid droplet, excuse me, turns into a free fatty acid, goes into the bloodstream. You now have fats for fuel. Well, is this ketosis? No, not at all. This is that gray area between not using glucose and not being in ketosis. This is the foggy period that can kind of suck as your body's getting adjusted. Okay, so then your glucagon is now bouncing around to different fat areas saying, hey, red alert, we're out of carbs, start liberating. But then it says, you know what, I'm gonna go somewhere else. So after you know a couple of days or a day and a half or so of not having carbohydrates, the glucagon goes to the liver 
and says, hey liver, you've got some fat on you. I'm gonna go ahead and rip that fat out and start using it for fuel. The liver's like, hey, what did I do? But the reality is, there are some studies that indicate that close to a billion people on this planet have a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And I would say that burning some liver fat ain't a bad thing, right? It's something I think we could all stand to deal with because if the liver has a bunch of fat on it, the liver's metabolic function is impaired. So it's probably wise to go ahead and burn some of that junk, right? So anyway, glucagon goes to the liver. It says, okay, we're gonna start burning liver fat too. So you're out of carbs, you're burning body fat, you're burning liver fat, and then you reach another impasse. The hepatic cells, the cells in the liver, the hepatic fat cells become drained and there's no fat in them now. Okay, so you can still burn body fat, but the glucagon is still signaling to burn liver fat. So what ends up happening here is that signals the liver to hit the panic button. When the liver hits the panic button, it elevates something called AMPK. Now what AMPK is, is an energy sensor in the body. And this energy sensor dictates and understands and regulates. It says, okay, we're running out of fuel here. We need to really escalate the mobilization of fats because I don't think this guy's eating. So it's the job of AMPK to like really make an executive decision. It says, uh, okay, there's no carbs coming in. Glucagon's been running around like liberating fats like a madman. But now we're getting serious, okay? We're running, like, the, the hepatic cell, the hepatic fat cells are just like, okay, they're starting to use their fuel. So AMPK upregulates. This escalates everything. And it activates something called PPAR, which I talk about all the time, but I'm gonna keep it very simple in the context of this video. PPAR is a protein that allows cells to use fat more. So what happens is PPAR then allows a transporter called CD36 to allow fat to get into the liver fat cell. Okay, so then what was an emptied fat cell now is getting fat brought into it so that it can go through beta oxidation and burn. So you have kind of an interesting weird process. I know that's kind of complicated. The point is, is that PPAR alpha is very important to this piece. But now we have another problem. Okay, we're out of glucose and the brain is demanding glucose. The brain does not like to run on fats, contrary to what people say. I don't know why they say the brain loves fats. Fats are maybe from a nutritional component good for the brain, but the brain doesn't literally run on fats. It just does not. Now it used to be thought that fats could not cross the blood brain barrier. That used to be the thought process like, oh, fats, they just don't cross. Furthermore, we start to see actually the brain is probably just a glucose hog because it's burning fuel so fast. Let me give you an example. If you were to go out for a slow jog, you're burning fat for fuel. If you break into a sprint or lift weights or play a really high intensity activity, well, that is going to use glucose. It's the difference between aerobic and anaerobic. Okay, well, your brain is probably more anaerobic. It's demanding more glucose. So it just doesn't have a need for fats because it never operates that slow. Fat oxidation is a slow process. The brain cannot afford to go slow. So the brain is a glucose hog. So now your body's freaking out. You haven't had carbs, you're liberating fat, which is functioning for some cells, but now your brain's got a problem. So the glucagon says, all right, we gotta go to plan B. So it goes to the liver and, the liver, and it says to the liver, hey, I need you to start making glucose. And the liver says, well, how the heck am I supposed to do that? Just figure out a way. So the liver says, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna break down extra components of this fatty acid backbone, glycerol. Uh, I'm gonna take some of that protein over there. I'm gonna take some of that alanine from that muscle tissue and I'm gonna and I'm gonna make glucose because I'm forced to. And it does, it's called gluconeogenesis. So now, after a period of time, a couple days of not having carbohydrates, you are manufacturing glucose out of thin air. But we run into another problem. That next problem is that, okay, well, you're manufacturing glucose, but it comes at what expense? Your muscle. You're breaking down alanine as the primary substrate for gluconeogenesis. So your muscles are like, hey man, what the heck? Dude, you've been like working for years on building me. Why are you breaking me down? It says, you're right, that's kind of messed up. I don't want to break you down anymore. Let's figure out another way. Hey, I've got an idea. Ding, ding, ketones. This is where ketones come in, okay? This whole process has been regulated by gluconeogenesis, by PPAR alpha, signaling the body that it is time to produce ketones. Why are ketones produced? Because guess what? The brain can use glucose, the brain cannot use fats, but the brain can use ketones. So ketones are manufactured from fat as an alternative fuel source for the brain so that gluconeogenesis does not have to go into hyperdrive sucking up all your muscle. So don't get mad at the ketones. The ketones are there preserving your precious muscle that you've worked so hard doing that bench press exercise for, right? 
There's a whole bunch of other regulating processes, regulatory factors, right? PPAR alpha drives what's called FGF21, okay, which drives ketogenesis and drives ketosis in general. But then also this FGF21 drives something called PGC1A. This is where things start to get wild. Everything we've talked about before has been just about energy utilization, finding ways to get scrappy and make energy. But now, after a few days, things start to get really cool. Okay, because ketones are formed and this FGF21 is produced, it is now driving PGC1A, which literally will go into the cell and demand that we produce more mitochondria, more energy factories. It is pretty wild that after just a couple days of cutting out carbs, we are suddenly having not just a demand for different energy sources that might be more advantageous to our body composition, but we're also getting a stronger demand to produce more factories. It's like your body became so deprived of energy for a little bit that it said, oh shoot, we, we gotta build more factories. We, we have no choice. So what does it do? It elevates mitochondrial biogenesis and you start producing more energy factories. The downside is these energy factories will go away. They don't last forever. You have to continually get yourself in a little bit of a deprived state to allow these energy factories to flourish and to be able to be produced. And guess what? That signaling will continue. It will continue for a long time. When there is a demand, they will come. If you build it, they will come. If you need it, it will be built. It is so unbelievably wild to see what a simple carbohydrate elimination can do in how we use fuel, but also in molecular changes within our body, and even molecular changes that can drive genetic expression, gene expression that can really change our life. So are you going to do this, like those Instagram videos for two weeks and try to get results? Or are you gonna actually focus on what's happening inside your body with the biochemistry and really nerd out and have an appreciation for what we have here? Because by doing these things, you learn. By learning, you can adapt. By adapting, you can become more metabolically flexible and live the life that you want to live and be the optimized version of yourself. So, I don't know, I'm gonna go do this for a little while. See you tomorrow.